Um, and thanks to all of you for braving this very bitter uh, first day of spring cold. My, I'm Lee Kaufman, the Associate Director of the Haggerty, and this evening, in conjunction with the exhibition Images of the Virgin Mary on view right upstairs, Dr. Melissa Katz will deliver the address, The Virgin Mary in the Visual Arts, as the first Lillian and Mark Boydman Old Masters Lecture at the Haggerty. We invite you to join us for a reception in this gallery following the talk. The Wortman Lecture Series is funded by a recent endowment gift from the Wortman Foundation in support of an annual Old Masters Paintings and Print Lecture. Lillian and Mark Wortman were lifelong collectors who were introduced to Marquette and to Milwaukee when Mark came, became president of J.I. Case and Racine in the late 1950s. As they came to know Marquette, they began to donate works from their own collection. And by the early 60s, Marquette had received 17 old masters and the 14th century, 14th century Joan of Arc Chapel. Their gifts, alongside other gifts to the university at this time, including our Salvador Dali Madonna of Port Ugat, gifted by Enid and Ivan Haupt, laid the groundwork for the building, the building of the museum on the Marquette campus. The Haggerty is indebted to the Roitmans for their foundational gifts of art and now to their family foundation for endowing this lecture series. We are very pleased to have Melissa Katz as the inaugural Roitman lecture speaker this evening. Dr. Katz earned a PhD in the history of art and architecture in the Department of Art and Art History at Brown University <coughs> with a dissertation that investigated images of the Virgin Mary in medieval and early modern Spain. Prior to that, she served as a curator of European art at the Davis Museum and Cultural Center at Wells Lake College, where she co-organized the, the exhibition Divine Mirrors, the Virgin Mary in the Visual Arts, and co-edited a book of the same title with Robert Orsi. Dr. Katz recently returned to the United States from England, where she spent 2012 as the Lever Hume Visiting Postdoctoral Fellow in the History Department at Exeter University. We are grateful for her return, allowing for her to speak to us this evening. Welcome, Dr. Katz. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, techies, how is my mic sound? Everyone can hear me? OK. Uh, more than a decade ago, I set out to organize an exhibition similar to the one on view today in the Haggerty Museum, in which a teaching museum's collection, oh, I might as well advance, and its history were filtered through the presentation of one woman, the Virgin Mary, as depicted in Western art. Slicing off a part of our permanent collection that dealt with the Virgin Mary gave me hundreds of works of art to choose from spanning the 12th through 20th centuries. Working thematically rather than chronologically showed the breadth and reach of the museum's collection. In this case, it was the Davis Museum of Wellesley College in Massachusetts. And it allowed me to publish for the first time a solid scholarly study of a good swath of our permanent collection. I could have accomplished these goals just as easily by assembling an exhibition of portraits in the permanent collection. Better, in fact, because that would have allowed me to go from the ancient Assyrians to the contemporary day. Or I could have chosen a theme such as landscape, wildlife, food and feasting, or any of the other dozens of ways of approaching art thematically that permit a curator to skip through the centuries, hitting highlights along the way. This, however, would have deprived me of one of the greatest joys of the whole undertaking, the wonderful shock on the faces of various college officials when I told them that I wanted to fill an entire exhibition space with pictures of the Virgin Mary. First, there was the religious problem. Wellesley was a secular institution deeply committed to religious tolerance and openness a liberal arts college whose students came from a variety of ethnic, cultural, and religious backgrounds. So in true New England fashion, being respectful meant not talking about religion. 
With the help of the college chaplain, I convinced the deans, the trustees, and not least the museum director to that public conversation about the religious nature of art was not only healthy but also essential, and that fears of public protest and offense could be offset by education and transparency, precisely the missions of a university museum. Secondly, there was the thematic challenge. How to make a series of works of art selected because they depict the same subject all seem different, individual, yet relevant to a contemporary audience. Finally, there was an aesthetic problem. How do you keep a gallery filled with images of the Virgin Mary from looking like a Christmas card? <laughs> and I can see the Haggerty staff laughing because they faced exactly these same challenges in the, divine and, in the design and installation of images of the Virgin Mary upstairs. I titled my exhibition and its accompanying catalog, Divine Mirrors, the Virgin Mary Unveiled employing two metaphors, that of a mirror and of unveiling. The latter imply the revealing of hidden truths, and the former a process of reflection, or better yet, reflecting. Mary's portrayal in the visual arts I proposed could reveal back to us the ideas and ideals of earlier audiences, elusive views of men and women as they had seen themselves, were seen by others, and wished to be seen, and these are three very different things. The ubiquitous figure of the Virgin Mary would become our mirror, reflecting back to us the lies of our ancestors. And if these artworks were mirrors, I asked, and we looked into them, what images of ourselves would we see reflected back? Today I have been given the precious opportunity by the Mark and Lillian Reutemann Old Masters Lecture Series to look back and reflect on this complex topic. In today's talk, I propose to re-examine this premise and explore how images of Mary not only reflect people's lives, but also eclipse and obscure them, especially women, distorting our perceptions of past generations. Today's metaphor will be one of veiling and concealing, with an emphasis on hidden commentaries on female behavior as seen through old master images of the Annunciation. The use of visual art as a religious and devotional tool has always been a conscious process for the institutional church. Initial discomfort based on the Ten Commandments prohibition of graven images or the making of the likeness of anything in heaven above or earth below caused anxiety in the earliest centuries of Christianity. But art was soon seen as a way to distinguish between the nascent Christian faith and its Jewish precedent. Saints Augustine of Hippo addressed the teaching value of image versus text in the fourth century. And Pope Gregory the Great, writing in the year 601, not only approved of the presence of visual art in church settings, but was also quite frank about its usefulness for the conversion of pagan peoples. Explicit justifications for the use of works of art in Christian worship can be found in the decrees of the Second Council of Nicaea, promulgated in 787. But the language used was very similar to that used by the church in the Council of 354, and again in 1547 with the Council of Trent, and 1962 with Vatican II. This is not to imply that the presence of art, visual art in churches never went unchallenged. There has been much debate, dissent, and rethinking throughout church history, but rather to stress how early the incorporation of devotional art was institutionalized. Even though we don't have a lot of art surviving from these early um, centuries, we do have these documents that do state and confirm that the church was fine with using images. From its inception, the church did take pains to distinguish the use of religious art from the worship of idols. This was always a really tricky business. According to the justifications clearly set out by Gregory the Great and Thomas Aquinas, among others, art was a tool for teaching the illiterate, a means of honoring the saintly, and a way of remembering the salvation story. To these functions, instruction, veneration, and remembrance, we must add adornment. What enriched God's house enhanced his glory. From this arose the vast array of artworks that now fill so many museum collections. Religious art in museums is largely removed from its original role and function. 
divorced and decontextualized from these didactic origins. Displaced in the confines of the secular cathedral, they prompt us to ask what role images of the Virgin Mary play in shaping modern assessments of women's achievements. What messages of prestige and power are received from the abundant retelling of this one woman story? And should contemporary museum goers continue to be assaulted by repetitive pictures of this one particular female? To whom does this modern Mary belong? Is she strictly a Christian figure? Or can her identity resonate with women and men of all cultures, ethnicities, and faiths? Strangely, these questions are not new. Mary has always been an uneasy bridge between the three Abrahamic faiths. Those are the ones that derive their um, origin from Abraham, the Abrahamic ones. And this slide is my pictorial um, illustration of multiple Marys. Mary, first a Jewish maiden from, pa from Palestine. Mary, a Christian. She is rarely mentioned in the sacred writings of Christians first century. Yet nonetheless, she became a prominent figure in the new religion. Her absence from the four gospels is much remarked. Her silence is less so. I read recently, or maybe I heard on NPR, somebody going on about how the Magnificat is Mary's greatest poetic performance. And I thought, duh, of course. It's her only sustained speech in the guy like book. You take it away and she does she barely has enough lines left to earn her an actor's equity card. She's, she's really a silent figure. But these are sacred texts, ta texts that we are dealing with, written for specific communities, not to record Jesus' biography, and certainly not to record Mary's. For details of Mary's life, we have to turn to extra-biblical texts prepared by later writers to satisfy the faithful's growing curiosity about beloved four figures. Details of Mary and Jesus' early lives, now commonly accepted, first appeared in the second century manuscript known as the Proto-Evangelium or Infancy Gospel of James. Its relatively late emergence provides insight into an evolving faith still in the process of defining its origins. One gauge of the rapid acceptance of the Apocrypha regarding the Virgin Mary is their full incorporation into the Koran in the sixth century. And I'm going to show a lot of slides from here um, at the Haggerty because one can choose anything. In, you know, there's so much art out there. I thought, would it be nice for you to see some of the works here? Then some of them are in the exhibition, some of them are not, but I'm going to try to have a Milwaukee focus here. Um, but back, the, the um, full incorporation to the Quran in the sixth century. Because Islam views itself as a successor to the Abrahamic faiths, the final one, key points of Jewish and Christian beliefs are folded into its sacred text. Hence, the Muslim holy book includes a detailed account of Mary's life, from her birth to her death. Praised for her chastity, devoutness, and trust in the Lord, Mary is considered one of the four perfect women of Islam. She's also the only woman to have a Quran chapter named after her. Indeed, details of Mary's childhood, such as the name of her parents, Joachim and Anna, whom we see here in Willem van Herp's painting, are found, appear not in the New Testament, but yes, in the Holy Quran, albeit in their Arabic forms, Anna and Imram, just as Jesus is called Yesa and Mary, Miriam. And I don't know if there are any um, cricket fans out here, but having just spent a year in England, I love the fact that Imran Khan, the great Pakistani cricketer and politician, is named after the father of the Virgin Mary. It really makes the world smaller in an odd way. The Annunciation also appears uh, in the Quran, where the, arch the archangel Gabriel, just as in Luke's gospel, announces to Mary that God has chosen her to bear his son. Mary, an unmarried virgin, claim the Bible and the Quran. Mary shall conceive and give birth to the infant Jesus. Disagreement comes over events after the birth. For Muslims, God has given Mary the gift of a righteous son who will become a great prophet of the Lord. 
For Christians, a great prophet who is the son of the Lord. This is all very interesting, but let us recall that this information is known to us today because at this moment in history, we are very aware that we live in a multicultural, multi-faith community, and we eagerly seek out such parallels between the Christian Bible and the Muslim Quran. The original audiences for old master depictions of the Annunciation would hardly have been aware of this shared heritage. However, they would have been attentive to other significant factors that are quite lost on audiences today. We recognize the Annunciation through a series of familiar signs that coalesced over time into a standard depiction of one sacred moment. Although there are some intriguing variations, including the graphic representations of conceptio per aurem, conception by hearing, which I show you here, in which the word of God made flesh is, is interpreted literally by scenes of the Holy Spirit whispering into Mary ear, Mary's ear. Can you see here the Holy Spirit is coming to whisper into her ear? She is literally going to conceive via the word of God. Or in the case of the Würzburg tympanum here, um, it's a marvelous scene where the, the word of God is sliding along a ribbon that comes here from God's mouth right into Mary's ear. But after some flirtation with these really interesting variations, most of them kind of coalesce themselves to restrict to restricted depictions of the essentials of the angelic conversation. Pre-modern audiences were encouraged to see much more than that, an entire ballet of symbols and gestures that are lost on us today. Despite the compactness of the gospel account, the early the er, um, Renaissance, medieval and Renaissance Annunciation extended across several moments, expanded to in, compass a gamut of emotions and postures. In Luke's gospel, the archangel Gabriel visits Mary to announce that God has chosen her, an unmarried virgin, to bear his son. Her initial response is guarded. She was greatly troubled, we are told. But Gabriel assures her not to be afraid. Her final reply, let it be to me according to your word, affirms Mary's central role in the new religion. From this short encounter, theologians were able to distill five distinct stages of the Annunciation, moments which a Renaissance preacher termed the angelic colloquially, defining the stages as, do I have it out for you there? Yes. Um, looking along here, conturbatio, disquiet, cogitatio, reflection, interrogatorio, inquiry, humilitatio, submission, Emeritatio, merit. And we'll be back to that slide so you'll get to see it again later. The visual clues that signaled Gabriel's arrival, Mary's reaction, their conversation, her contemplation, and final ascent were encoded in a series of gestures. Gabriel's posture remains the same. He raises his hand in an ancient gesture that has always denoted speech. This is rhetoric, it's from the ancient world. Mary, however, never merely raises her hand in reply. Rather, she can react with awe by holding her hand, oh, by holding her hand to her breast, as seen here in the Duccio, in the panel from Duccio's Maesta, in response, shocked response to the angel's dramatic arrival. Or she may extend her hand in a welcoming gesture, as in the Antwerp panel from the Met, where the startled virgin has regained her composure. She may signal fear by drawing her veil around her and recoiling from the apparition, a moment evident in Simone Martini's well-known Annunciation of 1333. Or she may lower her, oops, come back. She may lower her head in modest descent as in Nicolas Bertin's painting from Loyola University. Mary's contemplation of Gabriel's message, the fourth moment of the colloquy, could also be broken down into several stages or several pages to judge by the many wordy sermons on the subject. Prayer is often the demeanor adopted by the Virgin as she considers the angel's news. 
have a prayer. But I relish Mary's gesture in the Memling painting, where she seems to raise her hand to silence Gabriel's joyful speech, asking for a moment to take it all in. Though one could equally interpret this as a gesture of surprise, reluctance, hesitation, and contemplation, all of which were intellectual stages of the angelic colloquy. I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Over time, um, the subtlety of such strategies faded as artists distilled the Annunciation into a shorthand of familiar signs. A room, an angel, a young woman seated or kneeling, lilies to symbolize purity, and an open prayer book, a sign of piety and devotion. Post-Reformation work, like the Bertin painting or Goltzius print, both on view in the exhibition upstairs, acquired added enhancements of bursts of light and swirling clouds of angels. Post-Tridentine Catholic reformers chose to emphasize the divinity and majesty of the moment of the incarnation in their artworks. Yet I appreciate more the early depiction of the Annunciation, excuse me, what I appreciate most in the early depictions of the Annunciations is their emphasis on domesticity rather than divinity. It's not a matter of personal taste, but their value as tools in my endeavor to interpret images of the Virgin Mary as indicators of the lives of the original audiences for whom these pictures were made and employed in routine devotion. And I will come back to that. Class and social status, though, I want us to consider before I get there, but class and social status are inescapable blocks to our assessment of past ages. That is a given. What history records and transmits are the opinions and concerns of the elite classes, whether it be the holders of secular power, the nobility, aristocracy, or landed gentry, or the holders of, or the clerical elite, rich in learning and resources. The glimpses of the peasantry that we might find in literature and art were largely designed to appeal to the interests of bourgeois audiences, not to document accurately the social stresses of the day. For art historians, the problem is compounded given the emphasis on quality, refinement, and high achievement that determines patterns of collection and dissemination. Luxury goods have always been collected, preserved, and transmitted from generation to generation in preference to the material culture of daily life and ordinary citizens. I research in images of the Virgin Mary precisely in response to these impediments. I see them as very democratic images, especially the humble cult statues, so over, often overlooked in the history of art, which were accessible to privileged and non-elite audiences alike. Both kings and paupers literally knelt before the same image in the famous shrines, images that form an, an alternative historical source that provides me with access to the concerns of social classes that had neither the, neither the means to acquire luxury goods nor the stature to leave a detailed historical record of their lives and circumstances or so I like to believe. Nevertheless, I must admit that works of art made for private ownership do not meet the criteria outlined above. They retain their class-bound distinctions, both in terms of audiences privileged to view them and information depicted within them. Take, for example, two of the enunciations we have been considering. An anonymous German panel from an triptych now in the collection of Wellesley College, and a work from the same decade, now in the Metropolitan Museum, painted by Hans Memling, and probably the left wing of a triptych. Notice the similarity in these works. The German artist is competent, but less skilled than the famous Memling. Yet both artists derive their work from the same precedent a composition by Roger van der Weyden that set the trend for Annunciation paintings for generations to come, both in Northern Europe and the South. The coincidence of figural arrangement, details, and design allows us to compare these two works, not only to assess artistic talent and aesthetic achievement, 
but also details of class and status, evident in the home furnishings each chose to depict. The same dynamics are at work in a third variant, which the elaborately furnished interior depicted by Jus van Cleve, also at the Met, which we'll see later. All represent middle class interiors. Here, there, we can see them a little bit better. Uh, all represent middle class interiors, I have no doubt, because both painters were bound by a tacit convention to endow Mary with the proper humility of status while still showing her adequate respect. This was trickier than it seems, because Mary was not only a heavenly maiden, but also a heavenly queen. A bride of Christ, a throne of wisdom, a tower of David, and handmaiden to the Lord. Thus at times artists were called upon to portray her as a regal, majestic matriarch, at times a tender and nurturing mother, and occasionally as both mild and exalted. Mary was both a virgin queen and ideal maiden, at times dignified and aloof, at times grief-stricken and desolate. Mary is a figure who carries us through a dozen centuries of art history, reflecting womanly aspirations and paradigms, while also exposing a range of emotions in interior states. And let us not forget that this archetype of womanhood presented here was very much shaped by male attitudes and perceptions. Mary's exception proved the rule that women's lives and achievements were less visible than men's. And the elevation of one woman to a status of high admiration did not necessarily bode well for all the others of her gender. To put it another way, male clergy and secular authorities urged pious women to emulate Mary's behavior. But the standard, she said, was one immortal women were bound to fall short of, given that none of them would be spared the stain of original sin, give birth without sexual intercourse, or remain pure and unstained while fulfilling society's mandates for motherhood. Nor would they retain their beauty, beauty like Mary does in devotional imagery. Real women age like Saint Elizabeth in very unflattering ways. <laughs> And I don't have time here to deal with the um, options of convent life as an alternative for route for women to emulate Marian perfection. But it's worth noting that the stories of holy women, mystics, female saints, abound with examples of defiance, disobedience, and the assertion of self-will, behavior which is generally considered inappropriate for women and inconsistent with Mary's model of obedience. As magazine covers demonstrate, women's visibility hasn't improved much in the intervening centuries. Hence, it is doubly ironic that Mary, the mother of God, enters the 21st century as the woman whose face has appeared most often on the cover of Time magazine and Newsweek. An ambiguous commentary on women's achievement, recognition, and historical visibility. Okay, we, we now have Hillary Clinton and Oprah, so maybe things will be better, but... Who's the runner-up? Lady Di. I worry that society is very much setting up our daughters for failure, charging them in the same way to give themselves wholeheartedly to their homes, their communities, and their careers, all the while staying thin and eternally youthful. The glorification of the exceptional woman, I repeat, does not bode well for the rest. The physical aspects which artists gave their pictures of Mary could prove as oppressive to women of the medieval and early modern periods as today's media portrayals of unending youth and airbrushed beauty, another way in which women patently fell short of the model held out for them. Artists were not alone Supposed to be a different one? Nope, sorry. That is the right one. I didn't realize it had died twice. Artists were not alone in concerning themselves with Mary's looks. The 15th century preacher Gabriela de Barletta, de Barletta, excuse me, he's a Dominican, he gave a sermon on Mary's beauty, a fairly common theme, in which he asked, was the virgin dark or fair? Albertus Magnus says that she was not simply dark, nor simply red-headed, nor just fair-haired, 
Mary was a blend of complexions, partaking of all of them, because a face partaking of all of them is a beautiful one. Hers, after all, as Dante wrote, was, quote, the face that most resembles Christ. Or as an anonymous medieval hymn praised it, Mary the mother, excuse me, Mary the mirror, Christ the vision blessed. That's where I got my title from, Mary the mirror. Christ the vision blessed. Mary's ever youthful appearance records contemporary historical standards of beauty. And it also conveys nuances whose significance is not immediately apparent to modern viewers. Particularly revealing is the manner in which artists treated Mary's hair. By tradition, married women wore their hair up and or with their heads covered, a custom observed in much of Europe and North America until the 20th century. Nevertheless, artists presented Mary with long flowing hair, even after her betrothal, conception, and birth of a child. Note the contrast in these visitation scenes where Elizabeth is shown modestly coiffed and Mary without any headdress, inappropriate for her age and her status as a married, not to mention pregnant woman. For both artists and audiences, the styling of Mary's hair was an indication of her perpetual virginity, which persisted through her married life and exempted her in their minds from the social conventions practiced in their own society. When married women encountered artistic depictions of Mary, they saw not a matron like themselves, wimpled, coiffed, bonneted, or hatted, but an adult girl with loose hair, at times confined by a delicate veil, and at times adorned with nothing more constraining than a halo or a crown. This artistic depiction made visible a generalized cultural attitude towards Mary's identity and ever youthful appearance. Back to the enunciations and domesticity. I have two more areas I want to address. That of domesticity is conveyed in these paintings and the less observed matter of literacy and privacy as promoted or not by artist depictions of the Virgin Mary. As stated are three variants of Roger van der Weyden's prototype, the vertical 1460s panels by Memling and an anonymous German artist, and the spacious 1525 scene by the Antwerp painter Jus van Cleve are shown here. Each depict interiors whose domestic furnishings were customized to appeal to a middle class clientele who would wish to see a reflection of their circumstances in the abode of the juvenile virgin. So choices made such as carpeting versus tile flooring, collinetted glass paned windows versus a simple ledge, three lilies in a smooth bronze ewer or one swirled in a barley twist pattern were designed to entice the viewer by placing Mary in a home like their own. The owners of the German panel could not possibly have been as rich as the commissioner of the Memling panel who was a, mem a member of the, Bur of the de Cluny family, members of Burgundian court circles, whose coat of arms appear on the carpet and in the window glass. Or they would have purchased a panel by a more skilled artist. The de Cluny household, no doubt, did include a silken draped bed. The German burgers household, more likely, had a modest sleeping alcove sensibly outfitted with a sturdy woven linen. My point is made, but please indulge me while I show you the fav my favorite detail, and I think the reason why I like this German enunciation so much, please look there. Um, as we look in this detail of the items on the shelves of Mary's reading dress, desk, from top to bottom we find a cheese round and a plate of fruit with a knife, one snuffed candle, which indicates that the incarnation has already taken place, a book, and a box of red, white, and green wool wound in balls with two crossed knitting needles. I love to knit, and I think that's why I love this picture. You almost, you, often, you can often see Mary knitting, and of course she knits seamless garments, wouldn't she? But, uh, 
<laughs> you don't often see the knitting needles. She's usually sewing like in the class and the Clayson and Holy Family upstairs. Um, let's look at a lovely detail in the memling too that just blew my mind when I saw it. The candle that Mary holds in her hand to illuminate her prayer book is a rarely depicted but historically accurate depiction of a braided candle, which you make from a string dripped in wax that is then efficiently coiled. And that's how you would make it. And then you would just, as you needed more, you would just pull up a little bit more of the string. And I'd read about them, uh, but I'd never actually seen one depicted. So you see how many places you can go by examining images of the Virgin Mary in art? The domestic interiors depicted in the Jus van Cleve panel, made a generation layer, typifies the Antwerp taste for elaborately decorated interiors, stylishly furnished and noticeably bourgeois. The most telling details here are the inclusion of severally careful chosen works of art, which inform us how devotional art would have been incorporated into a middle class household. Above the bed is a round dell with a landscape surrounded by 15 pearls tacked to the wall, literally using four nails, is a hand-colored woodcut of Moses, and on the draped home altar, a tabernacle depicting scenes from the Hebrew Bible. Like the Moses, they represent Old Testament prophets prefiguring New Testament themes. An inscription across the, bat, the base identifies the Grisai figures painted on the doors as Abraham and Melchizedek. Mary here also reads an illuminated prayer book. Similar to the books of hours the patrons would have used in their own daily devotions, Mary in this case both models and mirrors the proper behavior of a worshiper engaged in image-based devotion. Modern viewers are often surprised by the consistent display of literacy in Marian art. Did women of the late medieval and early modern periods sit at home calmly reading like the woman shown in these Annunciation scenes? The extent of women's literacy cannot be determined with complete accuracy, but recent scholarship indicates that it was higher than previously thought. In late medieval courtly circles, women's literacy was actually higher than men's. Men just had to fight, they didn't need that as a skill. Bear in mind that the ability to read is separate from the ability to write, and far few people developed the latter skill. Although I think there's a category of semi-literacy, because often they're writing on wax tablets, and that does not survive. Writing with a quill pen and ink is quite difficult, but people had a certain amount of ability to write. Definitely much more literacy than we ever, ever thought. Few. Few members of the rural population could read, but this condition was independent of gender and encompassed Paris priests and other authority figures as well as peasant laborers. In cities, towns, and larger villages, however, trade and commerce called for the acquisition of basic skills. In the 15th and 16th centuries, upper middle and middle class urban women could generally read in their native tongue, if not Latin, and many were numerate. Merchants' wives and daughters would know enough math and writing to help the family in business and teach these same skills to young children at home, boys as well as girls. And these are the families who would have owned paintings, such as the Antwerp Annunciation. Mary's education would have hardly seen exotic or inappropriate to earlier audiences, particularly as she was meant to represent the ideal woman. But another aspect of these scenes would have surprised early viewers, her independence. She is alone at home, shown in private. Unmarried women were closely chaperoned and controlled by their families. Women's sex drive at this time were considered stronger than men's, and unmarried women who had to fight against these natural drives until they could be selfly married off were considered perilously masterless. That's the quote. Once they acquired a husband, of course, they acquired a master. No problem. 
Florentine archives attest to the success of such vigilance. Registers indicate that very few, remarkably few children were born before the eighth month of a recent marriage, confirming that couples did indeed abstain from premarital sex, thanks in part, no doubt, to the vigilance of family members over the whereabouts of betrothed maidens in the household. How these young women must have longed to have been left in peace like the Virgin Mary, to pursue their knitting in private or engage in solitary tasks like reading in a quiet chamber. What ultimately is the meaning of Mary? Sacred imagery intersects with secular experience in the presentation of the Virgin, as I hope I have demonstrated. Each generation discovers Mary anew, priding themselves in the ingenuity of their insights into this archetypal figure. Yet as we have seen, hardly anything in Marian devotion is truly novel. Men have long engaged with her as a role model and female paradigm, while women have long probed the messages of power and position received from images of this one perfect woman. Perhaps the greatest irony is Mary's enduring fascination. Despite centuries of patriarchy, colonialism, and religious ambivalence, the last authenticated Marian apparition took place in 1932. But sightings continue to be reported in locales as diverse as Zaitun, Egypt, Akita, Japan, Medjugorje, Herzegovina, Cameroon, West Africa, and Conyers, Georgia. The legacy of Western culture accompanies us into the third millennium. America enters the 21st century with a population for whom icons are found on computer screens, not in churches. Museums enter the new century with a mandate to provide a bridge for audiences of all ethnic and religious backgrounds to engage with a shared artistic legacy, and ideally, to reinforce the role of visual arts as a cultural nexus for the entire community. The figure of Mary, ambiguous, recognizable, and profoundly visible, I propose, can help us to serve this need. Thank you. And now I would be very happy to take any questions or comments from the audience. I noticed that the number of rooms indicated by the Spanish painters. <laughs> oh, yes, very good. Um, I, maybe I should apologize, but my specialty <laughs> is Spanish art, specifically medieval Spain, and so I love a lot of these works, and I'm very currently doing research that involves comparing them with certain German prototypes, so hence I've been looking at a lot of German works as well. And these are slides that I have and I love. As I said, part of the problem is there's just too many to choose from. So um, I picked out my favorites for you. Another question? Yes? Do you find um, that there are national uh, themes Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, they become more <coughs> profound in, after the Reformation when each country becomes very concerned with how religious art is going to be viewed and they're very consciously reinterpreting the depictions and then you see a lot of differences coming. So the Reformation is occurring in the uh, first half of the um, 16th century. In the earlier works, there's um, a surprising, often it's an indifference to the style. Some of the things I love is just how downright ugly works of art can be that are considered to be especially efficacious, especially um, miraculous. And it really doesn't matter to um, the believer that it be beautiful or not. That's something that we acquire later with museums. But it matters that it be local. There's this idea of local attachment. And it's always, people did understand that the statue is not the Virgin. 
They understood that very, very clearly. But there was definitely this competition of who's, I mean, the statue is, a, it, it's, it's the telephone. It's the conduit to heaven, to God on earth. It's meant to be serving that function. Um, and it's understood to have that function, but cults would grow up around particular statues as being sites that were efficacious, where Mary would listen, would intercede. But we know things like Einsiedeln, which is a very famous shrine in Switzerland, has a fire. The statue burns down in 1452. They just make another and the cult goes on. They understand that it's a block of wood, but you know, they also know that more miracles are going to happen with their particular Mary, and the rivalries are what you see in the Middle Ages. Who you should go to if you have an eye problem, who's gonna really help you if your child is sick. Don't go to, you know, and especially don't go to St. James and Compostela, go to the Virgin Mary and Salus. She's the one who's really gonna help you, he's indifferent. So that's where you see regional differences played out. Yes? Did you see the classroom piece upstairs where oh. they, what's the old thing? We've had a lot of controversy. Oh. It's a bird, <laughs> it's a hazelnut. Yeah, well, I did have a really, really close look at that. And um, I think what I told Amelia is that I was born and raised in Brooklyn. And I know nothing about nature. I was willing to go for plant. <laughs> I'm, I wasn't even sure if it was a plant or an animal. I was going with plant. <laughs> but I'm not the person. However, I did notice the sewing scissors and that she had a really nice pin cushion. And I was looking at Joseph's axe, but I'm, I'm really not good with nature. Uh, yes? Uh. Oh, there's, that's a good question. Mary, in the depictions of the Stations of the Cross, um, I don't know that much about that. That's coming as institutionalized an in art in the post-Reformation period. I'm not as much of an expert. I do know that before, um, I, I deal with medieval and late medieval into the early part of the Renaissance. And I know that there is a rise of following the Stations of the Cross and what they do is erect whole tableaus of figures. Really, and there are some wonderful ones in Italy. They're called Sacramonte, holy ma ma mountains. And especially the Italian ones do them in terracotta and they make these large terracotta scenes of the 12 stages in which you can literally walk along and move from one to one. But I'm going to look into the idea of when they get the stations of the cross in your parish church is something you do around the church. Because that's very interesting because, of course, that is entirely a passion narrative. I haven't dealt too much with the passion, but that's bringing in the later phase of Christ's life and involving Mary in it. And that's one where sometimes, that is one where in the Spanish art of the post-Reformation period, she does most more visibly appear in um, participating in her son's life during his teaching mission and his passion than you will tend to see in places like Germany and um, Northern France. I believe you had a question and then the woman here, yes. There's a slot there with a couple of statues one from Auburn and one from Church of Saint Denis. Yes, and in Cincinnati. <laughs> well, I mean, but it, was, it was striking that one is, you know, very, you know, they came from the same year, or I mean, approximately the same era, approximately the time. Mm -hmm. And one was very medieval, and the other one was actually a little bit more red. Was it this one? Not this one. one no, it's the one before. No, okay, because the, these are yeah. from very different um, centuries. This is the 12th century, so that's like 1150, and this is 100 years oh, later. Oh, yeah, and I did choose her specifically because A, she's from Saint-Denis, the most important abbey in Paris, and B, she's in Cincinnati. Isn't that fun? Would you ever think that you could go to, let's go to Cincinnati for the weekend so I can see the most precious relic from Saint-Denis. <laughs> So I said, there's so many Marys to choose from. I'm going to find a Midwest one. But no, this is, um, this is like a whole art history class, the switch from this kind of rigid front. This is really very interesting because it's all very self-conscious. Um, you know, a lot of people looking at it would just think is this is an artist who isn't as good 
and doesn't know how to carve, and this is one who's just really fab. But it's really not a matter of skill. It's a matter of, this is Mary as the um, throne of wisdom, the sedis sapientiae, throne of wisdom. And she is definitely not the nurturing mother. The evolution is she will become the nurturing mother that we know and love and see in our Christmas cards. But you can even see here that Jesus is a baby, and Jesus is not quite a baby there. He's kind of this little adult two-year-old sitting um, on her lap. And if you can see it carefully, you can't really see it here, but it's wonderful if you examine it. In these sedis sapientiae, which you find both on altars freestanding and in the churches, Mary often has her hands out like this. Here she happens to have it like this. She does not hold the Christ child. She is not supporting him. She is displaying him. She is making of her body a throne. She is the throne of wisdom and he is seated on it. And that is why they both are looking directly out at us and not really interacting and not really being warm and loving because the idea was to have this very majestic Mary as queen. And it's a slow evolution that we get of this wonderful figure of the Virgin Mary as the nurturing mother, but it is interesting in art to see the time that it takes before the two of them interact and look at each other. And suddenly you've got the sway and you know that this is a woman holding a real baby. And so this is not at all um, inability on the artist, but this is a Romanesque virgin where she's there to be, you are to be in awe of these people and this other mother where you are to identify with her and find that comforting. It's good noticing that. Um, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't know if I'm hearing you, but you were asking about the clothing that she wore that sometimes it's more regal and sometimes it's not. Yeah, there's... Um, it's a little bit more than artistic boredom, um, but it is this tension between you want to exalt her and yet you want to keep her humble. The depiction of her in these plain garments, um, at times, Theolo and th we know theologians would worry about this because we say, you know, we don't have many writings from the common people, but believe me, the clergy never stopped writing. They know, so we know all about their thoughts and their sermons, and we know that they were a little bit concerned at times that Mary be given her proper respect and that she be properly adorned, that she look a little bit better. There, and it's, um, someone could do a wonderful dissertation on the subject of um, can we get her dress to align with certain economic periods? Are there times when they want her to look wealthier? Are there times not? I know right away, right now we are in a period of um, economic hardship. We want our clothing to be glitzy. If you look back in the 1930s, the Depression was the time when movie stars were wearing silk charmeuse. If you go shopping now, everything out there is covered with sequins and all because we're feeling the poverty. So the correlation is often not like in rich times they'll dress Mary up in rich things, but it might be that, you know, in times of poverty, they want her to be adorned. They want her to be given this special status. Then things rock back, and then sometimes you get images that will emphasize her humility. The Madonna of humility, where she's seated on the floor, where she's nursing the baby. And I'm, that, I wonder if they do coincide with times of hardship or not, but people do go back and forth with, you want her to be the most beautiful woman on earth, you want her to be a standout, you want her to have every adornment you can give, and yet you gotta keep her this humble maiden. Yes? Yeah, it's 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 exactly that, and this is the the challenge for artists. 
Sometimes it's not the artist, sometimes it's the patron, especially if they're you know, working for the church who has a particular way they might see it. And in my anecdotes about women in the long hair, they wouldn't have looked at Mary and said, oh, it's wrong. Oh, it's unfair, why can't I do that? They would have looked and said, it's the sign that she's not like us. She's exempted from being ordinary. And, um, and yet, she's, um, sometimes when they will adorn, they will confine the gold. You'll often see it's gold along the band. She's not, you will see saints who are completely in rich gilded robes. Mary is really entirely gilded, but there's often adornment there and the band will have text that we can read and figure out exactly what they're quoting and saying. So they'll play this game of adorning her and seeing that she deserves something special, but also seeing it as this moment in which to interpret her more. Yes? Okay, um, well, the earliest, <laughs> earliest images are in places where they survive. And that's where we have to put it. Uh, things that are made of wood and these materials burn in fires, they degrade. So what tends to be preserved and transmit well is a manuscript. The earliest images are in books because the books are stored shut, and that preserves the page, it preserves the color very well. Uh, wall paintings and things like that, they would have had, but they would have been repainted, um, modernized. I said the worst thing uh, for any church was to be wealthy in the 17th century, for any, the worst thing for any community was to be wealthy in the 17th century because everything got baroqueified. You know, and they just couldn't stop. Nobody could just hold back improving. And, um, so we have to face that a lot. The earliest images that we have are in books. There are some frescoes. There are a very rare, I think the earliest panel painting I know of comes from the sixth century. They are found in Syria and Sinai, Egypt, the Middle East, and you say, why are they there? Because they were part of the Byzantine Empire, they were in uh, monasteries, and they were very far from Istanbul, Constantinople. So when the, Bi the Byzantine church went through its period of iconoclasm and very enthusiastically burned all of their art, the people who were living in the middle of the desert in Sinai or Syria figured who's going to ever come and see our panel. So if you want to see a panel painting, you go, that's from the 6th century, you will find it in an Islamic country, which also underlines uh, Islamic countries have been very respectful of the art of other religions. Um, it is the Christians who go around destroying their own art. It's the Christians who go and destroy the art in Hagia Sophia. Once Hagia Sophia becomes a, a, uh, a mosque, they leave it alone. Um, in terms of our very, very earliest um, statue, it comes from the 10th century, 975 something. It's in Essen in Germany, and there are some other golden Madonnas, and we think they survived simply because they were gilded. They were polychrome wood that got gilded, and they just got saved by the treasury because they were respected as being more important. You can find mosaics of Mary. Mosaics are another very durable form of art. You can find Byzantine mosaics in, um, of the Virgin from the third and the fourth centuries. And that is getting back pretty far of time. You can find Byzantine art of the Virgin best conserved in Italy because again, in the Byzantine Empire itself, in Greece and modern day Turkey, they destroyed it all very enthusiastically. But if you go to Ravenna in Italy, which is a little bit off the tourist track, that is where you can see fourth century images. Could you, um, could you either repeat that or stand up because I'm having trouble hearing. Uh -huh. Yes, the five stages. And I don't understand the mirror. Oh, um, okay. There we go. 
First of all, the terms, um, I chose one particular Dominican um, sermon because I thought he had put it very well. His name is, uh, I believe, Fra Domenico de Cartolozzo de Lecce. I can get it for you if you want. But merit is the idea of the moment when Mary assents and says, let it be done according to my will. And that I see is this kind of a gesture of looking down is assent to her head. It might look to us like a welcome here, but I believe this moment in which she has her hand, she lowers her head and holds out her arm is her saying, yes, I will. The idea being that the first moment is where the angel arrives. It is disquiet because it is not very normal to have an angel show up in your home. And angels always wear fabulous angel garb. If you think that Mary is richly dressed, you see she is, she, even in the ones where she's got a lot of gold and embroidery, when you look, that's where you find the angel is totally over the top. So you know that, you know, the angel's gonna be, that's gonna be disturbing. And she will have these very interesting repertoire of emotions. You may have always wondered why would she, the artist even want her to be reeling back in fear. It seems to be disrespectful, but it's actually showing this fear and shock at this moment. Or here where she's, you know, the astonishment, or there are moments where she's welcoming. You can, you can of course it becomes, um, a game, you suddenly go around looking and saying, ah, I'm going to guess it's this moment. Um, I think an artist like um, Goltzius, one of the great things about this print is not only that he's such a good printmaker, but he gets so many moments. Do I have um, one of, there we go. He, look at how many moments he gets into that. You really do get the sense that the angel just arrived, because there's always a big difference with whether his ings, wings are open or not. This guy has definitely just flown in and landed, and he's so excited, he's starting to talk. So this is one in which you could say that Goltzius is getting, is, this is a more sophisticated, refined view where you're getting many moments, and you can hear that this is a here, a who me, Thing, but because of the emphasis on speech and the looking, you're already getting that suggestion of the conversation. But do we get that sense that she's agreed to his request? The ascent, no. And the ascent is what this particular um, Renaissance preacher did refer to as, you know, the merit. Her, the Mary's merit is that she will say yes to the request in this last scene. So that's the last moment. There we go. And in between comes the contemplation, many ways to go, I'm thinking about it. I'm taking it in. OK, is that clear now? <laughs> All right, yes. Um, when you find the church recognizing the opportunity to merchandise the woman, which I absolutely love, is I'd say pretty much in our own day. Uh, I think all of those call it covers on Newsweek, well, the Mary's on, it's actually, it's Time Magazine that I last spoke to just double check with the editor, but um, Newsweek has more of their covers on the web. Um, that's why she's still being, um, portrayed so visibly because she has become the feminine face of the church. She has become a way of the church of discussing issues and reaching out and seeing Mary's role. Um, I feel that that wanes after the Reformation because there is such a concern, an articulated concern, that the art be shown, be accurate to uh, the gospel. And there is um, so much worry, worrying about the way El Greco has depicted the armor of a Roman soldier, worrying about certainly, certainly somebody clued into the fact that the infant Jesus should not fly down a sun ray, nor should he come the holy um, spirit whisper into Mary's ear. So once you have to get absolutely true, there becomes this distancing and there becomes a great distancing for Mary in the Reformation with the idea that she has gotten to be too important. She is threatening the focus 
on Jesus. The Protestants are using this and making fun of her. Even though Martin Luther re retains his admiration for the Virgin Mary throughout his life, he is very adamant that he is a supporter of Mary. He wants her feasts retained. Uh, other reformers, Calvinists, they are definitely not feeling that love. They are making fun of him for it. And I think the church in reform and trying to very much use art as propaganda merchandising becomes a little bit uncomfortable and suspicion. Now that's within a European context. It's very interesting to look at these things as well in the new world in terms of the spreading of the gospel to the Americas and to Asia because we have them going out to the Philippines and India and Macau. And the, Vir the Virgin Mary becomes in terms of colonizing aspects a wonderful way of working into um, uh, developing a certain comfort level with native populations. She also plays very interesting roles in America in the 19th century in which immigrant communities are coming and bringing loyalties and love from home. And the difference between Protestant America and Catholic America is often seen in the Virgin Mary. And as, you know, this is a, a vast generalization, but I, I um, recommend that you read Robert Orsi, who I worked with on the catalog for this, because he has studied the Madonna in the US in, in um, working class ethnic communities from about 1900 to 1950, and talks about how as immigrants wanted to, um, became more assimilated and wanted to adopt uh, American ways, join the American elite, they became more and more reticent about their love of the Virgin Mary. She became less and less visible in American churches and things. And so I think it's really in our most recent generation that this idea of Mary, merchandising Mary as a way to get people interested in um, Christianity and spirituality is very much a product of the modern age in which both the church and the believers and the faithful are seeing uh, great possibilities in her co-redemptrix. I don't know if you've heard of that, but there are movements and motions to make Mary co-redemptrix, in which it's giving her a certain status uh, in heaven. This is after the Mary's assum death, assumption, coronation in heaven, she becomes co-redemptrix uh, co with Christ. This would be very interesting, um, because the church may very well get around to it, like they got around to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. 800 years, it only took them 800 years until they decided on that, but they finally got around to it. So I think you know, in another few hundred years, we may have Mary as a co-redemptrix. The church is not doing anything in haste. And when they do, when they declare Mary to be a co-redemptrix, they will arrive exactly the point that the Ethiopian church arrived in the 15th century. Because the Ethiopian tradition is wonderful. They made Mary co-redemptrix, in the 15th century, and she has always shown seated next to Jesus equal in their pictures of heaven. So again, everything has to be looked at locally. Do we have time for any more questions or do people want to get something to eat? <laughs> well, I'm happy to talk if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, I think I can release you all to the reception. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>